is a, an incoming president of the Alumni Association. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 21st annual Celebration of Law Alumni and Students of Color. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us for our first virtual celebration. Um, it is lovely to see so many alumni, students, faculty, staff, and friends in attendance for tonight's celebration. This event is an annual tradition in which we celebrate and honor our alumni and students of color. This year, we have ventured into the virtual world to safely continue this tradition in the challenging times we are facing. We are thrilled to be joined by guests from around the country and from many different legal professions. Tonight, I have the pleasure of serving as both the MC and the young alumna speaker. I am pleased to be joined by the Honorable Michael Wu, who will serve as our keynote speaker and our student speaker, 3L, Shayla Ramirez. You'll be hearing from our speaker shortly. Now I have the pleasure of introducing Western New England University new president, Dr. Robert E. Johnson. President Johnson became the sixth president of Western New England in August, 2020. His unyielding belief in higher education as a public good and as a path for tra transforming individual lives has led him to dedicate his 30 year career to preparing students to adapt and succeed in a dynamic future. Dr. Johnson's leadership career spans nonprofit colleges and universities in the Northeast and Midwest, including public, private, urban, rural, small, and large institutions. His career reflects several firsts as an African-American leader and the youngest person holding a major senior administrative role. We are thankful to be joined by President Johnson tonight. Welcome, President Johnson. Thank you so much, Tasha, and thank you all for being here uh, on this evening. Uh, it, is, um, it is exciting to do this event um, virtually. Um, not often do we have the opportunity to uh, take an event that has been face-to-face -face for some two decades and take it to a virtual world. Well, we are in a new normal, and I thank you and I welcome you, and uh, I want to now, thank all of our alums and our students uh, of, of color who, uh, who are engaged with our law school. Uh, the law school is one of the cornerstones of Western New England University. And as I started thinking about this event, um, I started thinking about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King when he quoted the prophet Amos, uh, who said, um, let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. And as I think about the day and times that we're in, if ever there was a time for justice and righteousness uh, in this world of inequality, uh, in this world that needs more social justice, uh, if ever there was a time for our law school, for our students and for our alums to come together and to help us figure out how to transform the world and leave it better, it is now. Uh, when I think about the fact that this law school has over 100, 150 sitting judges right now, uh, I think it's fair to say that we are equipped to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness as a mighty stream so that the Western New England voice can be heard throughout the world. To our students, I want to say this is your time. This is your time to make a difference in the world and leave it better than the way you found it. You can no longer wait, just like those before you did not wait. You can't wait uh, until things change. You must become the change. To our alumni, I am eternally thankful and grateful for all that you've done over the years. So as we think about um, the impending election, regardless of how it turns out. We must pursue justice. We must pursue righteousness. We must pursue equality. Um, justice is supposed to be blind. I'm counting on each and every one of you, the alums uh, of, uh, who are here today and our students who are the future for tomorrow to make sure that happens. So let us not wait any longer 
to make change happen. So I'll simply close with the words again from Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, for so, much, so, for so often they keep telling us to wait, wait just a little while for justice, wait just a little while for equality, wait just a little while for freedom. That word wait almost always meant never. It is like a tranquilizing thalidomide, relieving the emotional stress for a moment, only to give birth to an ill-formed infant of frustration. Well, Western New England family, Golden Bear family, we're not going to wait any longer. I welcome you to this event and enjoy this evening. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, President Johnson. Um, now it is my um, privilege to introduce Dean Suda Seti. Um, I'm really excited to introduce Dean Seti. Um, Dean Seti became Dean of the School of Law in 2018 and has served on the faculty since 2006. She has taught courses in constitutional law, law and terrorism, national security and government accountability, contracts and business organizations. I had Dean Seti for business organizations. Um, prior to joining the faculty of Western New England, Dean Seti was a litigator with the New York law firm Davis, Polk and Wardwell, where she focused on antitrust and security regulations matters. Welcome Dean Seti. Thank you, Tasha. That's very kind of you. Um, and uh, thank you, President Johnson, for your words. Uh, you are a, a hard act to follow, as I've learned in the couple of months that we've uh, worked together. But I, I appreciate being able to be here to welcome everyone and to see so many uh, wonderful, familiar faces uh, here as I, I scroll through the screens um, on Zoom. Uh, even though we're virtual, it's terrific to be able to connect. Um, so. This is one of several events that the university and the law school are planning to celebrate alumni this fall. And I just want to make sure that I take a moment to mention just one of them before I, I get to my formal welcoming remarks. And that's our never, November 13th celebration um, of uh, alumni and their awards and also of Bruce Miller, who many of you know, uh, retired in uh, May of 2020. We are, had planned a celebration for him in April of 2020. It was postponed until this fall, but uh, you know we are unwilling to postpone our, our celebration of his work any further. Uh, it's out of admiration and, and love for him and out of uh, love for his commitment to social justice that we are celebrating his career and also doing some fundraising for the Social Justice Fellowship being established in his name and in his honor. So please do come, uh, remember to celebrate with, um, with Bruce and with our amazing alumni who will be winning, uh, being uh, conferred awards on that evening of November 13th. Um, and, and Bruce, I, I appreciate you being here too and, and uh, already starting the side conversations with some of our alums before we got started. It's uh, you staying true to form, which I appreciate. Um, so this is my third year uh, as Dean of School of the Law at the School of Law and my third time that I get to come and speak to this group of folks in what is really one of my favorite events of the year. Um, I've spoken with you previously about how much pro progress our legal institutions um, have made in the last several decades and here I'm thinking about the profession as a whole, uh, the judiciary, law schools, any vehicle that involves uh, the practice of law and the exercise of legal power, and how much progress has been made with regard to the diversification of the profession and to matters of racial justice. And I've also spoken with you about how much work we have left to do. All of us know that representation and racial justice matters and that the work of making a more diverse legal profession and a profoundly more just society is a shared enterprise that we take seriously. We also know that this is not a matter of working for a year or even a decade. This is the work of generations and there are sometimes setbacks and moments that give us pause and perhaps make us wonder whether that work is progressing in the right direction. And in this year in particular, we have been reminded time and again, just how much work we need to do, just how much black lives must matter. And we must remember our mission is one worth pursuing. 
if and when we are able to increase the number of people of color working as judges, law firm partners, district attorneys, in-house counsel, legislators, heads of government agencies, heads of nonprofit organizations, activists, community lawyers, and those who, who represent underserved and sometimes oppressed communities, we have a better shot towards racial justice. We have a better shot towards a more just society and to doing the important work that needs to be done um, in a world that has significant and severe disparate impacts on communities of color. And today's political and societal landscape, we see that in criminal justice, we see it in state violence against individuals, fair housing, immigration, labor rights, and any number of other areas that I could name. And at the law school, we take this really seriously as part of our mission. And I want to take a minute just to provide an update on a couple of the matters uh, that relate directly to these issues. So this summer, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and so many others, the law school faculty unanimously passed a resolution to commit to anti-racism as a core principle of the law school and its work. So this has already involved numerous concrete actions that we are taking as a collective. Our orientation committee brought in Western New England alumnus Justin Hurst of the Springfield City Council to talk to the incoming 1Ls, including a focus on police conduct as a matter that Springfield has to come to terms with as well as state and national, as well as it being a state and national matter. Justin charged our students to work towards racial justice throughout their time at the law school and beyond. We've been encouraging students to incur, engage with our Center for Social Justice on this front, even as 1Ls and throughout their time at the law school. And we are one of the founding law schools in a new ABA Police Practices Consortium that provides a vehicle to analyze and advocate for change that will be real, meaningful, and visible in the city of Springfield and hopefully well beyond that. Among our faculty, those in charge of programs and speaker series made a commitment to programming that focuses on racial justice in the law. Among them, a program on the disparate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color in the region. The Massachusetts Fair Housing and Civil Rights Conference, focusing on the eviction crisis and its impact on communities of color throughout the state. And other programs run by our Center for Social Justice and by our faculty who lead these programs. These have been terrific, drawing in current students, alumni, prospective students, and members of the community in huge numbers. Our professional development committee continues to work on integrating anti-racism teaching across the curriculum, drawing in experts from across the worlds of legal academia and experts in diversity, equity, and inclusion to hold workshops with the faculty and to continue helping us build the skills that we need um, to develop anti-racist curricula. Our curriculum committee is considering a potential requirement to take a racial justice oriented course in the upper level curriculum and doing so in conjunction with our student leaders who have been talking to us about the need for change in our curriculum and beyond. Our library has collected and shared resources and links to databases to support faculty and students engaged in racial justice related research and writing, whether it's for classes, independent studies, or for law review notes. Our Dean of Students, Michael Johnson, also with us this evening, is working on increasing the mentoring, outreach, and support for students of color as they enter law school. We've been talking to alumni, foundations, and others to support the racial justice initiatives and student support at the law school. I'm working with fellow Massachusetts deans on a committee convened by the Supreme Judicial Court on rethinking barriers to diversification of the legal profession across the Commonwealth including the bar exam and including other barriers to entry to the profession. And we're working on strengthening our pipelines to help uh, build a real cohort of students who are coming to the law school from HBCUs, uh, Hispanic serving institutions and other places uh, where we can help build the funnel of diverse students coming into the law school. And we've been working with uh, internally at the law school and externally with, with partners like the Law School Admissions Council to help us with this work. And as I mentioned last year, we established our Center for Social Justice at the law school, which encompasses a tremendous amount of the work that we already had been doing and has served already as an incredible organizing vehicle to provide more support to students and faculty and to help us engage in truly tremendous ways with the greater Springfield community. And the center's work in areas of economic justice, 
racial and restorative justice, immigrant protection, the rights of the LGBTQ community and others is making a real difference. So if you're interested in learning any more about these efforts, please let us know. We'd be thrilled for you to get involved. And I wanna end by just thanking everyone here for all that you do, students, alumni, faculty, staff, and friends. I wanna mention again how much I appreciate all of you coming together as a community, being here this evening, and sharing in this wonderful event that helps build and strengthen and recommit us to important values and principles at the School of Law. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the speeches for the rest of this evening. Indeed, Seti, were you going to introduce Shayla or would I put myself on mute too soon. Hi everyone, back again. So I get the honor of introducing Shayla Ramirez more formally. Um, Shayla is uh, not only a, um, a terrific 3L at the School of Law, she's the current president of the Latinx Law Student Association and the Student Bar Association. And in that latter capacity, I get to meet with her every couple of weeks as Dean, where we can talk about uh, what's important to the student body, how the law school is responding to student needs in this very unusual semester. And she has been a terrific part of even the planning committee of faculty, administrators, and her from the springtime onward to make sure that we've been having a successful semester at the law school. So I am deeply appreciative of everything that she does and her commitment both to the school and to social justice and racial justice writ large. A little bit about Shayla. Her parents emigrated to the United States from the Dominican Republic. She was born and raised in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Prior to attending law school, she studied social work and politics at St. Anselm College. Her interests include legislation and politics, as well as family and constitutional law. One day, she hopes to be the mayor of her home city of Lawrence, and I have no doubt that this woman, with her power, her intellect, and her drive, will be able to meet her goals. Thank you, Shayla. I turn it over to you. Wow, Dean Seti, that was so nice. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I would like to thank the deans and everyone who put this amazing event together. I would also like to thank my family and friends for being here virtually tonight. Um, I've always had a few quotes in my heart that always keeps me going. My favorite movie, Robots, the main character always says, see a need, fill a need, whenever he feels lost. My dad, Carlos Ramirez, always said, it's not the most talented, it's the one who works the hardest. And my mom, Marielis Feliciano, always says, if you don't absolutely love it, Chica, then don't buy it. When I was a child, I was not good at reading like really not good. I was put in a special class, but the class was just me. I wasn't able to go to recess for a lot of my time in elementary and into middle school because I had to practice my reading. My mom being the mother she is made me read to her every single night. We didn't have many books, so there's probably some books I can recite to this day, cover to cover. By the time I was graduating and heading into high school, they gave out graduation, graduation awards. And they gave out the reading award and they said my name, much to my surprise. It was a victory I would never forget. The trials and tribulations that I went through are the things that make me who I am. We're living in a difficult time right now, but I think everybody in the Zoom knows about difficult times. We've been through a lot. Things have happened in the last few months that have completely changed our world, but I would like to highlight the good. Many people have started thinking differently about what Black Lives Matter means, especially those of us in the law. There have been a surge of protests with that exact theme across the nation. Some of the biggest protests in our lifetimes. Places that you would never think to see those words have been, have been said or, or painted on walls, murals, and even statues. When I was in college, me and my friends hosted a die-in where we laid on the floor to represent those who have died at the hands of state violence. And back in 2015, Manchester, New Hampshire, it wasn't received well. During college, I would have to explain to professors what power dynamics are and how that influences higher learning. When I wore my I can't breathe shirt to the democratic debates, there was only one candidate talking about racism, not just as a problem, but as something as American as baseball and apple pie. But today, 
I'm not saying that we've solved racism in America. We're far, far from it. But there's something inside of me that feels like we're a little bit closer to where we want to be. I don't know a single person who did not do something for Black Lives Matter, donate, make signs, post on social media, and even take to the streets. People who may not understand what's going on, but they're trying and they're trying to have that conversation. When I got to law school, I came in wanting to make a change in my community, in the law school and in myself. Lawyers are experts at the law, but in some way we're much more. We learn about people, we're the people profession. Speaking to the law students in the room and some lawyers, let's take it back to 1L. My first year of law school, I struggled, specifically academically. I didn't know if this was the place for me. I felt like that kid in elementary school again. I didn't know if this was the place for me and it was hard, but through the help of the best gaggle of friends, Professor Orlin, and a tiny bit of hope that I had in my heart, I was able to make it to my last year of law school and with good grades at that. Um, it's hard being an only at a law school, only person from your family to go past high school, one of the only Dominican people here, feeling like you're the only person who still has that childhood dream in their heart that they're still chasing. I've been wanting to be the mayor of Lawrence since I was 12. But then something happens as you go through it. You become more confident, you find your people, you find what you love to do, and you make great friendships in the meantime and even a great love. When I was in high school, I always wanted to be part of student government but I was too shy. Then when I went to college, I became vice president of my class, but I realized I wasn't really vice president material. Then I ran for president over SBA and I lost. And then I ran again, uncontested this time. And this is probably the most stressful I've ever been, but also the happiest. That's what my story is about. It's not a victory speech of all my successes, it's all my losses that made my successes even sweeter. I'm honored to be speaking with all of you guys today. And if I can leave you with one last thought, I think life is about opportunities. The opportunity to be great doesn't come knocking at your door. Sometimes you won't even realize it's there. But when it is, always remember this quote from the late Chi Chi Devane. You ain't gotta get ready if you stay ready. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shayla. I see everybody's already joining me in a virtual round of applause. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and now I have the opportunity to introduce our young alumna speaker. Uh, first, I suppose I should introduce myself. My name is Alira Donisvich, and I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Programs here at Western New England University. And it is just my pleasure to be here with you all tonight. And I'm just so thankful to all of our speakers. So I just want to put that out there. You guys are incredible. So thank you for joining us. Um, let's see. So where am I? So as I met, as she mentioned earlier, attorney Marshall graduated from Western New England School of Law in 2016 and has been an active member of the Western New England University School of Law Alumni Association Board of Directors since graduation. Currently, Attorney Marshall serves as the board's president-elect and pre previously served as the chair to the Nominations and Elections Committee. She currently serves the city of Holyoke, Massachusetts as an assistant solicitor. Her practice areas include litigation, real estate, and providing legal opinions to the mayor, city council, and city departments and boards. Previously, Attorney Marshall Defended, defended indigent people in criminal cases as a public defender with the Committee for Public Counsel and Services. Additionally, she serves her local community as a member of the Lambda Beta Sigma Alumni Chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Inc. and frequently volunteers her free time on projects focused on uplifting underprivileged youth, sudden infant death syndrome, awareness, and healthy living for all. She is also a proud 2010 graduate of North Carolina a and State University, from which she holds a Bachelor of Science in Construction Management. And with that, I would like to welcome Tasha to the stage. Thank you. Um, so I was asked to share my story to law school and about my legal career. 
But contrary to the stereotype that lawyers love to talk about themselves, um, I'd rather give the current law students some helpful advice that I've learned along the way. Um, learning is trial by fire. So my hope is that my burn scars were not in vain and hopefully a law student on this call will be able to learn from some of my mistakes. Um, when I decided to go to law school, an attorney asked me, do you want to be rich or do you want to be a lawyer? Um, I guess contrary to popular belief, lawyers don't make a lot of money. Um, so <laughs> I still decided to go to law school. Um, pick your passions and then hone your skills of the legal profession to your passions. Don't feel like you have to change your ideals or your interests to fit into the legal profession. Make the legal profession fit into your passions. Your experiences are valuable. Don't feel like you have to change who you are to be accepted in this profession. Um, this profession is diverse. It's not as diverse as it could be or as we would like it to be, but with your help, it will continue to be diverse. And the only way that we can continue to gain diversity is if we continue to be ourselves and don't feel like we have to change who we are to adapt. Let's make the legal profession adapt to who we are. Pick your battlefield. Nina Simone says, young, gifted, and Black, we must begin to tell our young, there's a world waiting for you. This is a quest that's just begun. After years of practice, I was recently asked, do you want to be rich or do you want to change the world? And I've decided that we don't have to choose. Law is complex enough that you really can have it all. As students of color and now alumni of color, I think that we're often in this question of do I take a profession and something that doesn't pay a lot of money like public interest or do I do something that I know is going to make a lot of money and, I, and work in corporate America? You really can have it all. The question is, what I'm doing, would my ancestors be proud of me? You can break ceilings in corporate America and still serve your community. You can be in public interest and still serve your community. You don't have to deny who you are. You don't have to feel like you're betraying yourself or betraying your community. If you decide that you would rather make money as opposed to working in public interest. Next, I would say pick your battlefield. Don't feel like you have to take a job that you may not be interested in just because you feel like it's what you have to do. Being, as Sheila just mentioned, it is really hard to be the only. A lot of times I'm the only woman in a room. A lot of times I'm the only black person in the room. A lot of times I'm the only black woman in the room. But every time I'm in the room, I'm still Tasha Marshall and I still stay true to myself. Law students, I encourage you to pick your classroom. So when I was in law school, I was afraid of not being able to get a job after law school because of what happened to me after undergrad. I graduated during the recession. But I enjoyed learning from the field more than I enjoyed studying for my classes and my grades reflected that. But when I graduated, I had a full year of litigation experience under my belt because I volunteered at the public, um, public defender's office. So that was my claim to fame, to be one of 10 people who were hired out of 300 applications. I was not law review. I was not top of my class. I've never even tallied a class. But to be one of 10 people who were picked out of 300 applications because I had a year of litigation experience was definitely amazing. So pick your classroom, um, but still make good grades. <laughs> I still had a decent GPA. Again, keep access to justice as your number one priority. 
if you decide that your battlefield is corporate America, if you decide that your battlefield is being a public defender, if you decide that your battlefield is working in employment law, just remember to always keep access to justice as number one. Degrees don't come with a certificate in life skills. Maturity, kindness, and happiness are lifestyle choices. So in closing, I'll leave you with a few rules to live by. Stop doubting yourself. Yes, you are different. Yes, you may be the only one in the room that looks like you, but stop doubting yourself. You know what you know what you know. If you didn't know what you know, you wouldn't be here right now. Yield to wisdom. If there's something that you don't know, there's nothing new under the sun, so someone else knows. So ask questions. And lastly, go with your gut. You know what you know what you know. Yes, law school is hard. Yes, law school is different. Yes, it feels like you're learning another language, but law school is to teach you the why of life. We've all have done things as adults, signing contracts, um, just getting into different things, you know, that have to do with the legal side. But now you're learning the why behind it. You, now you're learning what disclaimers mean. So go with your gut. As Judge Boroff told me when I was taking bankruptcy a few years ago, don't leave your common sense at the door. And with that, thank you. And next, I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, the Honorable Michael Wu. Michael Wu is a Superior Court Judge for the state of Connecticut. He's assigned to the Judicial District of Litchfield in Torrington, Connecticut, and has what is known as a block assignment. This means that on any given day, he can be handling criminal, civil, family, housing, or juvenile matters. He's a member of former Connecticut Governor Mallory's largest and final group of appointees to the bench in 2018. Prior to being appointed to the bench, Judge Wu was the managing attorney at the Waterbury Office of Connecticut Legal Services, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the lives of low-income people by providing access to justice. In this role, he led a team of attorneys and legal assistants serving clients in Greater Waterbury, Greater Danbury, and throughout Litchfield County. While at Legal Services, he also worked in consumer debt program piloted by the Access to Justice Lab at Harvard Law School, seeking to develop effective ways to assist individuals who are being sued because of their inability to repay credit card debts. Judge Wu also spent nearly 30 years as in-house counsel for United Technologies Corporation in a variety of roles, including Chief Ethics Officer for Otis Elevator Company Worldwide, Head of Product Litigation for Otis North America, Legal Counsel for Otis Operations in Mexico and Central America, Business Director and Chief Legal Officer of an international jet engine collaboration of Pratt Whitney and Rolls Royce of England, and working at the UTC corporate office in the office of the managing attorney on attorney recruiting, training, career development. Judge Wu worked in private practice after graduating from Western New England School of Law as a litigation associate at the law firm of Howard. Ludorf in Hartford and later in his career practice with his brother in the law offices of James Wu LLC. Judge Wu received his Juris Doctor from Western New England School of Law in 1983 as part of a joint degree program with the Yale University Divinity School where he earned a Master's of Divinity degree. After spending nearly six years of his secondary and college education in Mexico to become fully proficient in the Spanish language, he earned a Bachelor's of Arts with high honors from Blackburn College. Judge Wu has always been actively involved in his community, including serving as pastor of various churches in Connecticut, simultaneously with his legal professions. He remains, he remains 
sorry guys, <laughs> he remains connected to the Western New England School of Law community by serving as a member of the School of Law's Dean Advisory Council. For the, fat, for the past 15 years, Judge Wu has led teams of youth and adults on annual work trips to a school for disabled children on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. In addition, he volunteers as a proctor and sleeps a month at a local overflow shelter for the homeless during the winter months. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Tasha, for that uh, wonderful welcome there. And uh, thank you for your words. Uh, I think that people are gonna wonder whether we exchanged our notes prior to each of us speaking tonight. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> good evening to you all. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, be part of this uh, great event here. Uh, I offer special greetings and a welcome to our new president, President Johnson. Uh, greetings to Dean Seti and a special shout out to Professor Bruce Miller, who probably doesn't want to remember me or never remembers me because I was the person who hid in the back row and never raised my hand. Uh, but he was also my advisor on my senior writing project. Uh, so he was a very important part of my uh, college uh, and, and my law school career there. Um, I hope that in my words here this evening, I can leave you with one or two comments that resonate with you and then might be helpful to you uh, in your career. And although my comments are in good part based on um, reflection of 35 plus years since graduating from Western New England, what I share with you this evening served me well when I was a student eating what we now consider very dubious food from the vending machines in the student lounge. Uh, while I was a recent grad elbowing my way into the legal profession, when I finally transitioned in my career from survival mode and doing whatever I needed to do, I think, uh, to repay my student loans to having the confidence to begin to craft and plan my legal career. And even today, as I navigate a new phase of my professional life as a public servant, uh, which trust me is, is different than anything I've ever done uh, before. Uh, and, and what I'm gonna say may sound like a bunch of cliches, but please hear me out here and, and, and see what resonates with you. Uh, my first suggestion for you all is that, uh, very much to what uh, Tasha was saying is, please don't lose your soul, okay? Law is a profession, it's not a cult that requires you to abdicate your morals, your values, and your innermost self. You know, let's face it, law school is an exhausting experience. Uh, you know, we're all learning how to think, rather than memorizing a bunch of laws. And in the process for a small fortune that you may have to pay back over the next 20 years of your life, you have the privilege of feeling like everything you learned prior to joining law school, entering law school, uh, everything in your academic experience didn't count because law school was so different. You know, getting a 1L, a 2L or a 3L summer internship position, even your first legal position graduating from law school is like being in a roller derby. Uh, it seems like <clears throat> connections that you unfortunately didn't have uh, got the job uh, that other people's got uh, that you wish for so often. And unfortunately, if you're looking for that day when you have enough experience so that you can just kick back and glide through the rest of your legal career, uh, my suggestion is you disabuse yourself of that, uh, disabuse yourself of that notion really, really quickly because not only does the world continue to change, but the legal profession is going to be forever changing. Uh, and we have to learn to adapt quickly and uh, take seize upon new opportunities, take changes uh, for opportunities to do something differently and to deal with the economic realities that attorneys cannot magically escape. So back to my point of not losing your soul, amid the insanity that you all picked, and I, I put this responsibility on your shoulders because we picked it ourselves, uh, that insanity that we picked for a career you need to take some time out to figure out who you are and really what makes you tick. Truly, there is a reason why you decided to take the LSATs, pay the application fees, and enroll in law school. Don't lose whatever excited you about that possibility of becoming an attorney. Keep that in mind throughout your career because that is what you need to find your niche in the law and lift yourself above all of the undesirable aspects of our profession. What I envisioned when I began my legal career, uh, when I'm by starting at Western New England School of Law, and what I ultimately did in the 35 years since that time aren't even close, let me tell you. In other words, I started off law school, um, again, working in a joint, uh, joint master's program with Yale Divinity School, assuming that I would do nonprofit law and basically uh, try to develop housing projects for low-income people. 
Uh, what did I end up doing? Uh, my career took me through um, losing my soul, quote unquote, I say that lovingly, uh, in corporate America to finding my soul back in, in serving in legal services and legal aid. Um, but again, what remained throughout my legal career was what made me tick, which is why, again, I go back to that point of don't lose your soul. I just like working with human beings and I like finding ways to make processes work better. And I always like a challenge. Uh, and I've had a goal since seventh grade. I wrote it on a piece of onion skin paper, which is something that most of you young people don't even know what is, uh, but it was erasable eaten onion skin paper. I wrote a little phrase there. I said that from this day forward, I will try to make one person's life a little better in each and every day of my life. So no matter where my legal career led me, I've been able to find those elements that I really, really love uh, about life. I've never stopped feeling fulfilled and passionate about whatever I'm doing. There are plenty of smart lawyers out there, and most of them are a lot smarter than I'll ever be. But one of the first cases I tried as a second year litigation associate in, in a private law firm was one where everybody else wanted to avoid because they thought it was gonna be a big loser. My job was to defend one of the largest chicken producers, whose name I will not mention here, uh, on the East Coast, one of the biggest producers of chicken, in a lawsuit brought by a 70-year-old white male who claimed that he was run off the road, I-84 in Farmington, by this big tractor trailer hauling a load of chicken. So not a lot of jury sympathy for the out-of-state driver, uh, truck driver, and not a lot of sympathy for the big corporate uh, defendant. Um, and so I ventured in taking that uh, case uh, because I was assigned. Uh, I flew down to Maryland to meet the defendant himself, the driver, on the eve of the trial. And while in his presence of his wife and, and, and sitting in their very modest but immaculate clean kitchen, he confided in me that he really, really felt that he was going to lose his job. He was going to get fired because of this event. He felt that there was no way anybody was listening to him, not his employer, nobody, uh, and that he was going to be nailed in this case. And as soon as the verdict came in against the company, he would be let go. Well, from that point on, I changed my whole attitude about that case. No longer was that the case that nobody wanted, but I was on a mission. I was in a mission because as he told me what happened, I realized that no one was listening to him. In my mind, I was convinced that his truck never touched that other vehicle. And I went on and started the trial and I proved my point. Uh, the, trial, uh, the trial judge uh, actually at one point said to me, Mr. Wu, I'm sorry, but I need to ask some questions. And he asked the plaintiff, so sir, are you saying that you're not sure that truck ever hit you? Uh, at one point, I was actually going to move for, um, and this is where you have to get your soul in the line too, but I got so excited about what he's doing that the plaintiff's attorney forgot to actually tie in the fact that the defendant, my, my client, worked for the big chicken producer and forgot to make that tie. But the, the, the judge looked over at me and said, oh, Mr. Wu, you're not going to file a motion to dismiss claiming that there's no connection between the person sitting next to you and that chicken company because he's wearing a shirt with a logo on it that says something farms, okay? And then I realized, okay, you've got to keep your ethics and you've got to keep your morals. And I didn't, I had it in my hand and I just put it back on the desk, on the table and said, forget about it. But again, just remember that there are so many reasons to be passionate about what you're doing here. You've got to be passionate and love what you're doing. Uh, and, and as also, again, as what Tasha and others have said, is don't check your experiences at the door, at the law school door when you get in there because everything you've done in your life applies to what you're gonna do every single day of your life. Uh, and it's not, I apologize, it's not in my script here today, but I just left the courtroom at five o'clock. And basically I had to deal with an issue of custody of where a 17 year old was gonna live. And I used my experience of raising four children uh, to figure out what I decided, what I believe would be the be in the best interest of that particular child. But again, we are problem solvers as attorneys. That's what our job is. We go into the world to try to make lives better. And if that's, where, what you, that's why you've got to figure out what makes you tick and then just pursue that. As what's been said, don't just chase where the most you know, glamorous jobs are. And in fact, as working in the, attorney, uh, the managing attorney's office at United Technologies, one of the things I counseled new attorneys on was don't always go to where things seem good. Because when things are at the top, there's nowhere usually to go. And this is my cynical corporate America side, but there's nowhere to go but down. So if you go into the business units that are down, you've got nowhere to go but up. And you're going to get a lot more good experience by taking on challenges uh, than going to where the job is going to be easy. So.
So, so in the same way that you need to know what makes you tick, what excites you and what interests you, my second suggestion then is that you be perceptive though of the possibility of how others feel and of, of, of how others are thinking and feeling, okay? When I say what they think, I'm not referring to the fact as to whether they're a Democrat or Republican, and I can't talk politics anyways because I'm in the judicial branch, so I'm not even gonna go there, okay? Uh, but there is a strategic benefit to hearing what someone else says um, before you open your own mouth. And I say that very lovingly to you all, but as a judge, I oftentimes marvel at the fact that lawyers say things and they say things that amazingly don't even respond to what the question that was asked because they're, they're on a script. They're so pent up, you know, they, they're so excited or, or so stressed over what's happening that they don't hear what's being said. Uh, but it's very, very important that we be perceptive of what other people are thinking and saying. Take a deep breath, listen carefully to what someone else is saying. And once you hear that perspective, try to figure out how to craft your reply so they understand your logic, okay? The first place where I found this helpful was in the law school classroom. Uh, after receiving some very mediocre grades, in other words, I decided that my job was to listen more carefully to what the professor said. And I began to actually take notes verbatim of what they were saying because, believe it or not, and, and I apologize for the professors who are on the line here, uh, but it, it allowed me to figure out how they thought, what was in their head. And by doing that, I learned how to think like a lawyer, okay? And so getting into my professor's heads was the way I learned how to think like a legal professional. And without really referring back to my transcript, my recollection is that I went from midterm grades of a 70, 75, and a 78, the final grades at the end of first year evening division, so we only took year long courses our first year, of 88, 90, and 93. But again, it was only because I finally sat back for a moment and said, I gotta just listen to what these people are saying and figure out how they think. The need to perceive doesn't end upon graduation. Um, as I've said before, you know, in other words, it's amazing how lawyers oftentimes open their mouths without listening first. There are no two judges who are alike. You've got to, you know, there are no two jury panels that are alike. You've got to make effective legal arguments um, as lawyers, and you have to actually possess a sound basis in the law, but also you have to know where people are coming from. I've had numerous trials where juries have surprised the lawyers in their verdict. The juries knew that legally they had to find for a particular party, but when it comes to damages, if they don't understand your logic or if you've offended them because of the way you phrase something uh, or the way you've characterized some other party, uh, they, will, they will offer very nominal damages to you. And you'll walk away saying, wow, how do I explain to my client that I won the case, but the judgment was less than the legal fees were to win the case, okay? But again, you need to really sit back and listen and try to figure out how other people are also ticking. So not only figure out how you tick uh, and what makes you go, but think about the rest of the world and those around you and figure out how they're thinking and, and how they're reacting and, and, and how they're perceiving things. Um, you really do need to figure out whether people are buying your argument or not, and you need to figure out whether or not uh, people totally understand how, how you're going. That also even applies in negotiations. In other words, one of the, one of the cardinal rules of negotiations is you try to make a win-win. And oftentimes in negotiations that I've had as an attorney, I will concede something that really in reality, to tell you the truth, was the sleeves off the vest of my client. My client really didn't care on that particular point. And it really didn't cost them anything. Um, but by giving it to something, uh, giving up to an adversary, something that you realize was important to them, but not very important to your client, you were able to bring the parties to a resolution. So one last comment about being perceptive and, and getting into the heads of others. Um, when interviewing, interviewing for a job, get into the head of your interviewer. You know, it's amazing how many times I've had to interview candidates. Uh, and when I was in corporate America, it was amazing because one of the things that we oftentimes heard from people who were applying from major law firms was, yeah, one of the reasons why I want to come to work at United Technologies is I want a better lifestyle. Now, granted that I agree that you have to have a, a good work style, a lifestyle and work balance, because if you don't, nothing's gonna go right. If your personal life goes wrong, your professional life goes wrong. I don't disagree with that whatsoever. But what they don't realize is that about 50% of the lawyers or 80% of the lawyers who work in corporate America who hear those words from someone applying for a job, hears, oh, so you're telling me I don't work as hard as you. Oh, that really works really well. 
And then what I got back as the management attorney at United Technologies were comments written like, this person doesn't want to work. They're only coming here to, to, to slide through the rest of their career. And nothing hurts somebody worse than that. Uh, and so again, get into the head of the person who's interviewing you, figure out where they're coming from, figure out what their passion is, figure out what the culture is of their law firm or their organization. And once you figure that out and then you can connect it to, you know, don't be disingenuous, but the aspects of your personality and your being that connect with theirs, that's where you're gonna find success. So third and finally, as I need to close up my comments here today, I suggest that you be very intentional about getting out of your silo. Okay, network. It's very, very easy in the legal profession to become an island. Suddenly you realize, you think that you're the only person in the whole legal profession that faces the challenges that you have, that has the same questions you have, et cetera. Part of that's endemic to the way the career works is that when you first graduate and you start in your first position, you don't wanna ask a lot of questions. You don't wanna admit your vulnerability. You don't wanna admit that you don't know because you're working with a whole bunch of people who seemingly know everything. But that begins the silo. That's where we become very, very individual. It also, just because of the way the profession is, is we are all OCD. We're all incredibly competitive, whether we're you know, shy or not shy. Uh, the bottom line is we are all to some level OCD. And that also causes us to silo ourselves. But we miss so much when we silo ourselves from other people. And so my suggestion is, is try to be intentional about having a relationship with people who aren't like you. If you're in corporate America, you need to be talking to and having a relationship with people who aren't there. If you're in public service, you should be talking and, and, and having a relationship with people uh, who are in corporate America. But the whole point is, is that it gives you a much better basis to understand what you're, where you are in your career and whether you're the only person who feels a certain way. It makes it safer for you to ask questions and share your feelings. Um, it is so important. But also, it is so important to network because unfortunately, the reality of the legal profession is, is it's still not a meritocracy, and I don't think it ever will be. It, it, they always use that charming word of, well, it's the culture of our law firm, it's the culture of our organization, et cetera, which is a buzzword of excluding people who aren't like themselves. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be, uh, sell your soul and be like other people, but again, oftentimes by networking, you can build bridges and have relationships with people who will be able to help you just because they know who you are and can vouch for your personality and for your work ethic. Uh, it is amazing how, as you go on through life, uh, it less, it's much less important what law school you graduated from, but what your reputation is within the legal profession. And so when you have a good network of people and someone says, hey, do you know Tasha? You know, she, she graduated from so-and-so. Have, have you ever dealt with her? And when they say, oh, yeah, I think she's really a great person. Not only is she a good lawyer, but she's a good human being. And that's the key there, because they don't just want good lawyers. They want to work with people who are good human beings. And it is so important for you, therefore, to get out of your silo, network uh, with other people, uh, be a part of, 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 of the group of legal professionals who are out there who aren't necessarily like you. And so I'm going to close with an injunction that you not forget about Western New England and your law school. Uh, because let me tell you, there is one funny thing about Western New England that I've found throughout my career is that whether I was working at UTC, which is, was a major you know, Fortune 25 company with lawyers who I thought were the best in the world. It took me years to figure out who graduated from Western New England because Western New England law school graduates never seem to want to admit that they graduated from Western New England. I don't know what it is. I think part of it was the intimidation that you're in Connecticut. And let's face it, Connecticut, the legal profession is dominated by UConn Law School. But that's great. UConn Law School is wonderful. My, bro my brother graduated from UConn Law School. Uh, so what? <laughs> okay. At the end of the day, Western New England has an amazing number of people in key positions in United Technologies, uh, legal. There are numerous Superior Court judges uh, who are Western New England grads in the state of Connecticut, all of which I didn't really get to realize until I became a judge myself. Uh, a fellow family uh, judge who was way ahead of me on the curve, uh, who does incredible mediations. I talked to her and I said, wait a minute, didn't you graduate one year ahead of me for, at Western New England? Didn't we used to sit in the same student lounge together? and try to, try to study in the evening. Um, but again, it's so important to maintain that relationship with those you graduated and studied with. In other words, I think they're invaluable. So I really do uh, hope that you will somehow uh, keep a connection with Western New England and its grads. Uh, I admit that I, I am saying that because 
I need to do that myself. That's why I'm now a member of the SETI's uh, advisory group. Uh, but really, uh, you have a lot to offer. You truly are a group of people uh, who are well qualified and our relationship as, with each other as fellow grads of Western New England is very, very important. And so I thank you all for listening to me. I hope you've been able to um, derive some benefits from something I've said. But again, I thank you all for taking the time out on a Friday evening to listen. I thank the other speakers for their amazing comments also. And I look forward to the small group discussions. Thank you so much, Michael. So now we are going to have a few minutes uh, for question and answers for our speakers. Um, we will also, after that, which fits perfectly um, with how you ended your speech, Michael, uh, we are going to have breakout rooms um, where you'll be able to engage in in-depth networking and conversations in kind of a smaller setting. Um, so please do stay on for those. So let's take a few minutes for question and answers. Um, feel free to unmute your line if you're ready to launch in or post uh, your question in the comment box, and I'm happy to read it on your behalf. And if there are no questions, I no. can ask. Oh, okay, go ahead, go for it. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right. So this is for Judge Wu. My name is Amara Ridley. I'm a 2017 um, Win You Law grad. I do have a question in terms of um, looking back on your career, both presiding over cases and in private practice. What would you say is one of the more underrated that was incredibly uh, beneficial to you in the legal profession? Okay, and I apologize, but I don't know whether it was my internet link, uh, but unfortunately I lost some of your words. So if you could read, uh, ask me again, please. Sure, what would you say one of the most underrated qualities um, an attorney could have? And maybe you look back and you say, you know, I wish more attorneys did this, or I found this you know, quality incredibly helpful. Okay, this is going to sound terrible, but uh, the thing that I think I wish, especially as a judge, that more attorneys had uh, that doesn't require law school education is just common sense. Okay, uh, and, and practical life experience. In other words, um, you know, I, 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 I work with so many people who are wonderful lawyers and they can tell me what the law is and they can do the analysis, but they, their, their solutions to the problems just don't make sense. Okay, and that's where common sense just is so important, uh, just life experiences. And, and, and I think sometimes um, lawyers just forget that they have experience doing other things in their life. So we had a couple questions come in through the chat. Um, so this one is from Talia Gee, and this is for Judge Wu. How do you suggest networking in this time of COVID? Okay, well, believe it or not, uh, just exactly what we're doing right now. Zoom is a wonderful way, in other words. Uh, but I think that, yeah, I think that you have to actually just take the initiative. Uh, and even amongst judges, it's funny because the judges silo like the, themselves too. If you're in a different courthouse, it's like the, the whole world is my courthouse and, and whatever's going on in New Haven, Hartford, doesn't matter to me whatsoever. Well, I intentionally Zoom once a month with some judges uh, who aren't from my jurisdiction. Uh, right now, interestingly enough, our whole issue is on race relations. Uh, that's what we're discussing. Um, but yeah, in other words, just, just take the opportunity and try to reach out and create a group of people and just say, hey, would you like to just Zoom once a month for half an hour, 45 minutes, just talk about what's going on in our lives. Thank you. All right, another question. This one is for Shayla. What will you do after a decade as mayor? Well, Technically in Lawrence, you can only serve for two terms. So I'd only be mayor for eight years <laughs> if we want to get technical. But um, I don't know, maybe my love for politics leads me to another path, maybe in a higher office, but, or maybe, you know, I decide to just stop the politics thing because I'm so over it. <laughs> so I don't know, honestly. All right, let's see. Um, I'm not sure if, let's 
see, Princess, was your question to, I think it was Tasha, are, and they're asking, are you practicing now? If so, what area of law? Um, oh, okay. I think it, it was for me and for Kel. Um, so I am practicing. I work for the city of Holyoke. Um, my title is assistant city solicitor. So I'm like right under the city solicitor. My office is really small. There's only three attorneys. Um, my primary focuses are litigation and real estate. So I'm like in-house counsel and it's so cool. Um, so I started off as a public defender and I had, when I was in law school, like I was a self-righteous public interest person. Like you couldn't tell me anything. It was like public interest or die. Um, because I felt like I have like law school is too hard for me to just go work at some law firm and make some white man rich. Right. So once I became a real public defender and I realized how hard it was and I realized it wasn't for me, it was really difficult because it felt like an identity crisis because I, I never thought of anything else. Like my entire identity was tied to public service and being a public defender. Um, so I went to the city of Holyoke and as Judge Wu mentioned, networking, um, a friend of mine had actually texted me and said, hey, the city of Holyoke um, is hiring. I live in Holyoke. I would love for you to be a lawyer there. Um, so I um, actually knew someone else who was working there. We had took a class together um, and, it, and it really worked and it was a really great transition for me because I'm in-house counsel to a city. So I see everything and I see every area of law and this is a, a plug for municipal law and government. Um, if you really want to make change, you making change within is amazing. Um, just being that lawyer in the room, like when we're making decisions, um, when we're making decisions, just being that that lawyer and also that black person, that minority person in the room that raises a concern that can say, like, if we're making decisions and I can say, hey, wait a minute, I see some desperate impact over here, you know, intentional or non-intentional. And um, I think that's important. I think it's really important for there to be more people of color in government who are making these decisions, who are at the table where decisions are made. So long answer, yes, I'm practicing. Any other questions? All right, actually one just came in. All right, this one, oh, go ahead. Or I'll answer this one that just came through and then Kel will go to you next and then we'll go into our breakout rooms. So this question is for each speaker. Let's see, who is someone who helped shape your experience, either in law school or when beginning your career? I can go. I can go first. Um, so as I mentioned in my speech, honestly, Professor Orlin, she has helped me so much. Honestly, like she's helped me so much. I really struggled my first semester of law school. I didn't know how to outline. I couldn't, as mm. Judge Wood was um, saying, I couldn't put my mind in the professor's mind. I couldn't figure out what they were trying to tell me. And Professor Orland was like, okay, we're going to sit down and figure it out. And she sat down and was just like, you know what? This doesn't make sense. And this actually does make a lot of sense. Continue doing this and don't do this. So, um, I'm very grateful to Professor Orlin for my experience um, in law school. So that's one person that's really helped me out. Okay, so Tasha and I are having uh, the showdown as to who's gonna go next. <laughs> Tasha, well, I'm gonna let you go first. Okay, um, can you repeat the question? It was, it was who inspired me? Um, Yes, yeah, sorry, let me scroll back up. We're getting lots of great questions. So who is someone who helped shape your experience, either in law school or when beginning your career? Um, I would have to say my grandmother. Um, my grandmother is an immigrant from Barbados. And a lot of times, like, I wanted to give up. I'm a spoiled American. Um, 
and I would just have to keep reminding myself, like, especially in the library and like, I didn't want to study anymore, especially studying for the bar. I had to constantly remind myself, like my grandmother didn't come to this country for me to be a failure. My grandmother didn't come to this country for me to just be like lazy and just, and act like I don't know who I am. Like I'm a child of God and I'm a child of Marjorie Marshall and my grandmother and I need to act like it. And my response would be, you know, numerous faculty members, but I'm going to do the call out again to, to Professor Miller. Uh, he was different than the other law school professors. Um, I was evening division and I was, I was going to Yale Divinity during the day. We were scared to death of most of our professors. And it wasn't until I had Professor Miller in con law that I actually relaxed enough to be able to actually begin to enjoy the law school experience. I'm not going to say I ever enjoyed the law school experience ever uh, because of the pressure. Um, but but he was he actually uh, dared to not just be the Socratic method professor who was going to terrorize uh, the evening division students because we were all coming from jobs or, or other activities. Uh, he actually relaxed us, I think, as a class enough so that we could begin to find where our passions were uh, and realize that we had our personalities that we weren't going to check in at the door. Uh, so I, I thank him for that. But uh, again, I think all the law school faculty have much more of, of, of an impact on our careers uh, than we initially realized when we leave law school. Thank you, Michael and Tasha and Shayla and Cal. Would you like to ask your question? No, I know you unmuted at the same time I was talking. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Sure, I'll I'll, um, I'll ask it uh, audibly since it is kind of a mouthful. Um, this is for Judge Wu. I was just wondering. Um, um, so I, I'm on a couple of panels at my job, I work for the Hartford, and um, you know, we're trying to hit race issues head on as well. Uh, I think everyone is trying to do their part, and I, and I hope they're all genuine efforts. One of the articles that we, we recently talked about was um, members of the judiciary actually getting involved and in pushing uh, big law and, and, and sort of cor certain corporations uh, to become more diverse and to at least put more diverse representation um, for court cases. Because even if they do have um, attorneys, you know, um, black and brown attorneys, sometimes they don't get into the courtroom. They're not allowed to second chair. And so we read a couple of articles uh, about a judge in California that actually um, required that a couple of law firms come back with uh, some diverse attorneys because of the 10 attorneys that were on the case, uh, they, they were all white males. Um, and I was wondering, have you had any experiences like this? And have you, um, you know, have you given any comments to uh, these kind of issues? Well, I, I think I've experienced it in, in numerous realms, not only in the judiciary. Um, and, and let me just start with, with uh, I guess the, uh, I guess the, 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 the disclaimers. Okay, so in the judiciary, we are mandated by our code of ethics to try to be as impartial as possible. Uh, so we're not allowed to, yeah, I can't put a political bumper sticker on, on, my, on my car, I can't have a lawn sign, I can't support any political candidate, etc. So what you end up doing, and, and I hope, uh, I know I'm recorded, so hopefully this won't come against me later, but what you have to do is you have to sometimes work in indirect ways. So the way I've tried to help uh, is that uh, there are some new practitioners who come through, uh, and, and oftentimes they are, they are uh, women and minority members who don't join the traditional law firms. And I'll see that, to tell you the truth, that they're being, there's unfair advantage taken, taken by experienced attorneys. And I'll actually stop the proceedings and I'll say, excuse me, so-and-so, um, but again, uh, I, I'm gonna intervene here because I'm gonna relax the rules of evidence, et cetera. What I try to do is I try to provide some guidance to the newer lawyers who don't have the experience and, and get them on, on a slightly better equal footing. Um, I will, I will I, I, again, uh, people who approach me, I will obviously respond and talk to them. Um, but again, it's hard because we're not supposed to put pressure on a law firm in any economic way or anything like that. Um, but I will, uh, you know, I will be intentional about letting law firms know when they've sent someone uh, who's female or minority into the courtroom and let them know and provide positive feedback. In other words, I, I think that the problem in the legal profession is usually no, you get no feedback at all. Well, you either get negative, which is really, really bad, or you get no feedback. And I try to provide some positive feedback. 
Uh, I don't know that the judiciary really can tackle it head on though and, and say that the larger law firms in Hartford need to have a certain percentage of, of minority attorneys, et cetera. Uh, it, it works, it, and it's gonna be a tough challenge. In other words, I remember when I was at United Technologies for summer associate program one summer. So I go off and I hire, you know, uh, there's four associates. It wasn't a big program, not like the big law, uh, but it was expensive for us. And we hire four people and I hired one female, one minority male, and two white males. And at the next legal meeting, uh, I was questioned by one of the older attorneys as to whether we were becoming white males need not apply anymore to United Technologies Legal. And it's like, what? <laughs> Come on. You know, it's like, you got to be kidding me. But, the, you know, we are facing the legal profession is a tough group. Uh, and we've all got to do in, in as many ways as we can um, try to try to equalize the, the playing field. But again, I think that mentoring and, and guiding is the best we can do in, within the judiciary and trying to level a pay, playing field, which is what we can do. I have discretion to relax the rules of evidence. Um, you know, I can admit hearsay and, and, and especially in a courtside trial or, or just a hearing and say, I'll filter out what I need to know. Uh, and that's, that's what I try to do. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to everyone who asked questions. Um, and I had several other questions come in through the chat. We are starting to run out of time. So what I will do is download um, your questions and we'll send them to the speakers. That way we can follow up and get your questions answered. Um, so now we're going to go into breakout rooms. So you won't need to do anything on your end other than possibly click join breakout room when it pops up on your screen. The breakout rooms will be uh, facilitated. Um, by one of our uh, discussion hosts. So don't worry, you will have someone there to help guide the conversation and get you going. I know we are a little behind schedule, so I probably will wait to pull everyone back until about 7.30 if everyone's okay with that. So you do have about 15 minutes um, to have your conversations. So with that, Katie, would you mind pushing everybody into their rooms? Welcome back, everybody. I just wanted to share, I know those were quick conversations. I hope they were enjoyable. Um, and I wanted to encourage you all to um, add each other on LinkedIn. I will send the attendee list out, um, which will include everybody's names and email. If you don't want your email shared, please feel free to email me and I will um, not include you, but I wanna make sure you all are able to connect after the fact as well um, to continue that networking that Michael was talking about earlier. Let me see, I can't tell if Tasha is back. There she is, all right, Tasha, I'm gonna turn the mic over to you now. Okay, all right, well, um... We are at the end of our program. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you for spending your Friday night with me and our guests and um, all the alumni and all the students. This was amazing. This is definitely something different than what my Friday nights have <laughs> um, uh, during COVID. Um, so I want to uh, encourage you to stay connected to the law school. Um, send in class notes, read the alumni newsletters, then uh, volunteer as a mentor, participate in alumni events, um, make a donation, share news of employment opportunities. Um, as you're becoming president of the Alumni Association, um, I definitely can't stress enough to um, the alumni that are on this Zoom call, please, please, please um, stay connected. Um, would love to work with you all and um, continue to our alumni association. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the program. Um, I look forward to seeing you all at future alumni events. And um, please add me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm definitely going to be adding a lot of you all on LinkedIn as well. So. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Shayla. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. And I hope everyone stays well. Um, and I look forward to seeing you at future events. Good night. All right, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Good night.